So uh, thank you very much, and thank you again for, for joining us. Thanks for your patience. So we have a really great panel here. Welcome Game Changers. How about that? Did, did you ever think you'd be considered a, a game changer? No, no. <laughs> uh, just to start out, though, I'm, I'm curious to know when you were first proposed or shown uh, the ideas or the script, uh, what made you want to take on each of these type of uh, films. So we'll start with you, Jackie. Um, I didn't know you you bring up your mic. I didn't know it was go. really a different type of anything. I just thought it's probably one of the first uh, movies that I ever uh, edited. And I thought, I'm lucky. <laughs> that was basically it. We were working, I was working on a show, on a, on a movie called Personal Best. And it was a very difficult uh, movie, and we were up and down with the Olympics and everything. And what happened was they shut it down at uh, Warner Brothers. They said, well, we'll come back and have some other, other we'll fix it. Said, okay. In the meantime, I got a call from Universal, and they said, we, uh, we were reading this story, and it's true, um, and uh, did you know that Latinos go to, go to movies much more than they come with their families? And I went and I went to a movie and I saw them and there were children walking in the aisles. It was a little noisy and stuff, <laughs> but it was, it was working. And so uh, Luis Valdez, who was a director, I didn't have a script or anything, he said, Universal is trying to point out who, uh, if Latinos would, if we could make movies for just a certain audience, and you know, through the Southwest or anything like that. So, um, so that's what happened, and it was very cheap. They said we're not going to go anywhere. You're going to go on one once. We don't want you jumping all over the place. We did everything at what was then the Aquarius Theater, which was hair, it was <laughs> in the 60s. And um, Zoot Suit had been a play, and he said, okay, we're gonna just basically film the play. We'll have maybe two or three uh, cameras, you know, wide, short, small, all that stuff. But he didn't, Luis didn't wanna do that. He said, I, I want this to look real. I don't want it to look like a play. And so they, I think the whole, I think it was about a million dollars is what they paid for this. <laughs> and um, and what, what they did was they built a circular rotating um, uh, stage and it had, they were changing this. Here's there's the jail. Here's the here's the home. Here's the the sleepy lagoon. Here's this, and they did them all just by moving around. It's very very creative because you'd get you'd be in the kitchen of the house, and then all of a sudden a, a musical thing would come up, and then it would all of a sudden everything would be moving, and it would be moving, and oh now you're in a jail set, and that's the way it went. And it's, it's a true story about uh, the Zoot Suit riots during World War II. And um, what they did was uh, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, people lived in, uh, Latin, Latinos lived in Chavez Ravine, which is now Dodger Stadium. But that's where they lived, and they lived in Boyle Heights. And they were zoot suiters, and they had the long this and a pork pie hat, and <laughs> very stylish. Yes, very stylish, and there was a lot of racism between that, and also in Chavez Levine was a naval reserve armory, so there were fights with, with sailors and with everything, and so anyway, that's what this, this movie is about, and it it starts out has funny things, it, it's lively, but it also gets very, very bad because um, 
uh, some zoot suitors, some pachucos, um, ended up in jail for, for a, a, a killing of some sailor that they really didn't do. But, and then there were the people like the, um, I think they called it the Sleepy Lagoon um, uh, Fund, and it was a group of uh, progressives who got them out without being gas chambered at that point. So anyway, uh, if you can see it, uh, this yeah. is the first of it. Well, we'll actually, we're, we'll go down the line. Oh, you're going to go right down. These and then we'll, we'll break down okay. the scenes, if that's OK. Sorry. But had you seen the play before uh, doing the movie? No. Oh, really? So it's just something you yeah. you took on as a, a personal challenge? I was so or? excited. No, I actually knew the story editor at uh, at uh, Universal. And this the story editor. He, he was the one who said, who read this thing about Latinos going to movies, and, and this was a big hit. It, it was played in, uh, out here for about two years. It went to New York, and it flopped in New York. So then we made the movie, and that's oh, what happened. That's what you do. Yeah, <laughs> and we had no money for this, really no money. And the, the, the uh, let's see, the cinematographer, was brilliant and Luis was brilliant. I, I really, this was sort of like, I, I didn't understand what even they were doing here, you know, it was really good. Oh, great, anyway. again, we'll, we'll take a look at a scene. So, Bob, about uh, the first mockumentary. Uh -huh. This is Spinal Tap. So, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> the great, great work. So, uh, were, you, were you given a script or was it a relationship? Uh, was there a script? There was no, there was no script. <laughs> There was a, there, there, actually I talked to my friend Karen Murphy who was the producer just the other day because I had, I had to think, was there a script? I couldn't remember. And uh, she told me that there was a script but it was, in, it was, the guys were forced to make the script by the producing company who had to have boards that said scene numbers and what would happen. And they would all, she told me a funny thing. She said also, they, you know, they said, how are you gonna make this film with this money? How are you gonna pay for catering trucks? And then she said, Look, as long as we have somewhere to eat, we'll bring sandwiches. <laughs> and how about facilities, bathrooms? Well, everywhere we shoot, there will be bathrooms there, so we'll use those. <laughs> so the film was really made on a, a shoestring. Oh. And uh, how did I get to do it? Well, I, I, this was, I guess we made it in 81, 82. And I'd come to America in 75 from England. And uh, not Australia or South Africa, English <laughs> accent. <laughs> and uh, uh, I had... Um, I'd, I'd, been, I'd gone to film school in England and I'd been an assistant there and done a little bit of cutting, but I came here and I said, I want to be an editor. So what I'll do is I'll edit. And I didn't do, you know, many people come up in their careers by being ass assistants to very good editors and eventually getting a chance to do work on very good films. I worked on a lot of crummy films and I really kind of discovered how to edit by doing that. Um, and one of those films, um, a few years earlier, was a film called Stunt Rock, which actually was maybe a precursor to Spinal Tap, but that was made by, made by an Australian director who had a friend in Australia who was a stuntman. He shot second unit on lots of Australian films, and this stuntman was his friend, and he wrote a script based around him as being a stuntman who came to America to see his cousin and his cousin, this producer, director, had also found this rock and roll group called Sorcery, who put magic in their act. So <laughs> he would come to them, and they, these two guys were cousins. I think the guy was the drummer, probably the drummer, yes. And uh, it was a crazy film. I mean, there was an excuse to cut to all these stunt things that he had. And, uh, but through that, uh, one of my assistants had a friend who, who would come by the cut room. Her name was Karen Murphy. And, Karen Murphy then later asked, shortly after that, asked me to go to uh, AFI and edit a film there, where they, at that time, they didn't have editing fellows at AFI. So they were, somebody was editing it, but the director wasn't liking it. So I went there and I poured my heart and soul into it. And frankly, from all the films I'd worked on, you know, this was actually this little AFI thing was the one closest to my heart. And uh, then, I, I went off and still did a number of other weird things. And then, but I stayed friends with Karen. And Karen, in the meantime, had, was, became friends, was friends with Rob Reiner and Christopher Guest. 
and was, became the producer of Spinal Tap. And somehow over that period, I, I, I had some other connections to them. I knew I made a film with this young man who came out from New York, uh, who'd made doc industrials and documentaries. I made his first learning corporation afternoon TV movie. His name was Stephen Gyllenhaal, who later on went to have two children and became <laughs> film stars. A little famous there. And <laughs> he and his wife, Naomi Fona, who was a screenwriter, they were friends with Chris Guest. Karen was friends with all these people. I knew them a little bit. I wasn't like go, you know, going in that field of people, but I knew them. And I was there at times when they talked about the film, and they were having a lot of trouble putting this film together because nobody got the idea of a fake documentary, and it would be shot in 16 <laughs> millimeter, and these people would be doing what? And you know, it's like, it just didn't make any sense at all. But somehow it, it meshed with a type of comedy that I knew from England. And so they, I was there when they were talking about it, and it got to be under, and also I was working on various films, and every now and again they, they needed something pulled on film, and I would pull that thing for them. And it just got to be intuitively understood that if they ever got to make this film, that I would cut it. Fantastic. So that's basically the short story of what happened, and then I cut it. Steve Rivkin, Avatar, small film? <laughs> Micro budget. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, game changer, um, most financially successful CGI 3D film. How was uh, how'd you come about cutting Avatar? Well, um, I just come off uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy, and Jim was looking for someone to uh, come in and help him cut the movie. He he realized that it was not something he was going to be able to do all by himself. <laughs> Um, the process proved to be uh, considerably more complicated, especially in the way he, cho he chose to approach it, uh, basically cutting the film two times, once in capture form and once for uh, virtual cameras. So it was, it was quite an ordeal, and uh, I, I got a very strange call to come down to uh, meet with the producer. I, I thought Jim was actually in New Zealand or uh, out of the country. So um, John Lando, the producer, showed me an art reel that just basically boggled the mind. You know, the design of, uh, and he'd been working with production designers for probably three, four years before that. So they had accumulated thousands of images that, that he put into a, a reel to show the studio to try and get the film greenlit. And I saw this reel, and it was like a world I had never seen. And um, I wasn't allowed to read the script at that point. I was just told the story. And, uh, and John said, well, why don't we go meet Jim? He's doing a scout right now. I said, a scout? Well, wh I, uh, but here? What do you mean? <laughs> he says, yeah. So we go out onto the stage, and Jim is holding this little little virtual camera that looks like a small laptop, uh, small like iPad or something with handles. And, and uh, he was looking inside of the virtual world, scouting a set <laughs> in an empty room. <laughs> so, you know, here's Jim with a big cable and people following him around, holding this thing, l scouting environments and sets. And I... I said, this is, this is crazy, you know? So he said, here, let me show you what, what we're doing here. And he took me into his cutting room and he showed me a scene that had been captured and he shot virtual cameras on and he put together. And I saw the capture with the actors in these crazy suits with dots all over it and funny stringy things that represented hair. And I thought, this is the wildest thing I have ever seen. Um, Sign me up. Yeah, right. I said I'm, I'm, I'm there. You know, I mean, if they, if he wants me, I'm there. What, whatever, whatever it takes. And that, that was how I got sucked in. All right. So uh, Paul Rubel, the first Marvel superhero with Blade. I actually didn't know that Blade was the first Marvel movie <laughs> until I was selected to be on this panel. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> And in fact, I'm not sure it was. Wasn't Howard the Duck ah. a Marvel movie? Maybe. Who edited so, that? So <laughs> that was Sidney Walensky. So um, 
I really shouldn't be here, so <laughs> no, please sit. No, <laughs> we have a scene. You have to stay. For okay, me. but <laughs> since I have to stay, how did I get involved in Blade? Well, um, backstory, uh, brief backstory. Um, I was an assistant assistant editor on several features, and then I transitioned to editing on some really low budget indie features, which went nowhere, and. Uh, so I went to work in TV, and um, I was able to edit in TV, thinking, OK, I'll just do this for a while, get my chops together, and then I'll go back to features. I ended up cutting TV movies and miniseries. I did 17 in 10 years. Wow. And every time I wanted to, you know, I heard about a feature and sort of promoted myself, it was, well, you can't do a feature. You're a TV editor, because that's kind of the mindset, and I think it's better now, but maybe still a little bit. Um, so I eventually um, did a couple of TV movies with John Frankenheimer, and then he was hired to replace a director on a feature and um, told the studio that he wanted me to do it, and the studio said, no, you, you can't hire him, he's a TV editor. And John, <laughs> bless his heart, said, you don't take him, you don't get me. Wow. So they had to take me. They didn't want to, they had to. And the picture was the famously disastrous island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> and our first preview was a disaster. And um, I was working in my editing room one day and my fax machine came to life and a resume spit out and it was a, like a famous Hollywood editor. <laughs> and I called up the head of post-production at New Line, and I said, uh, you know, I think I was just sent this by mistake. He said, oh my god, I'm so sorry I was going to call you, but we, we, we think someone needs to come in, someone with more experience, and, you know, take a look. So I worked with this guy, and we got along great, and we, you know, did his notes, and we uh, previewed it again, and it did worse. <laughs> And so he said, OK, goodbye, thanks. And, uh, and we just finished the movie as best we could. And then um, my feature editing career was over. And I went back to and edited a TV movie. And um, then I got a, got a call one day from the head of post-production at New Line, same guy who had sent the resume to the wrong fax address. And he said, we have a movie coming up. And, and I want to put you up for editing. And I said, that's really nice of you, but I'm shocked. I don't understand. You, you didn't want to hire me in the first place because I was a TV editor. And the movie was a critical and commercial disaster. Why would you? And he reminded me what I'd said to him on that phone call when I got the facts. Uh, when he was apologizing, he said, I said, it's all right. It's all right. It's a win-win for me. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, either he's going to come on and he's going to make the movie better and my name's going to be on it and so <laughs> it'll be better, <laughs> or he won't be able to think of any way to make it better and I'll know that I did the best I could with the material that I had. But either way, it's a win. And he was like, OK. But he told me that he had been so impressed by that that he wanted to put me up for this next movie. So I went and met with the director who um, I think was only the f second movie he'd ever directed, Steve Norrington. R unbelievably talented guy. And uh, I was the first editor that he had met with. And he said, basically, um, you can have the movie if you want to, but I don't know why you'd want to work with me. He said, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a total asshole. He said, in fact, he said, and I quote, he said, I'm as mean as James Cameron. I'm just not as talented. 